Good evening. You have a choice this evening. You can either have the 20-page sermon or the one-page sermon. Which would you like? The one page. It's the same sermon, it's just harder to read. So. Take. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to two passages of Scripture this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Romans chapter 12. And because we're so few in number, we're going to do things a little differently. Because we're going to kind of mosey our way through a couple of thoughts that I had. And I want you to interact with me at the appropriate times, okay? And uh, so I've got some questions and we've got some observations and uh, some comments. And uh, we're just going to have your feedback on some things uh, from the Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to read two verses. Please follow along as I read. Starting at verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Does it surprise you that this passage talks about our bodies? We are, when we come to church, are used to talking in, in maybe uh, realms of we talk about our souls. In fact, we, we know uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse uh, 26. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And in Deuteronomy, I believe it says, I shall love, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But does it surprise you that God talks about our bodies. He's interested in our bodies. And in the last year or so, it has become more evident to me that he wants us to do something with our bodies. In fact, that passage says there that God owns our bodies. So here's a question for you. Why does that bother us? God owns our bodies. Why does that bother us? One reason I suspect it bothers us because we don't have control. We want to decide what we want to do with our bodies. And we rebel against people telling us what to do and how to think and how to act. And how to live. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. What is the word in that verse that tells of ownership? What's, what's the word? Bought. When you buy something, you own it. So Paul's telling the Corinthians the people in the church of Corinth, his fellow believers, that God owns them. He owns them. We're going to get a little bit practical later on as to what that means. But this idea of ownership, God owns our bodies. Let me give you an example if I can. Suppose I had at the end of my driveway a vehicle that I was selling. I had a for sale sign in there. And, and uh, you came along and you happened to drive by and came along and, and looked at it. And we discussed the price. And I saw the, I signed the ownership over to you and we were clear. A, a, and you took the vehicle away to your place. Imagine if two weeks later, if two late weeks later I drove by your place and saw the vehicle and you had it all stripped and you're going to ready to hot rod it or spray paint it or do whatever you want with it, 
Maybe you're going to blow it up because you didn't like a Ford, whatever the reason. And I pull in your driveway. I says, what are you doing? And you say to me, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this and this with my car. You can't do that. Why not? It's a lovely car. Why would you ever do that? Well, the problem is it's my car. You gave me the ownership. I paid for it. Yeah, yeah, I did all that, but why are you doing that? Well, hold on. Because I paid for it, I can do whatever I want. I can throw it in the river and let it float away if I want it. Why? Because I have ownership. Once somebody has ownership, you, they lose all rights to claim on your life. And if you are a child of God, he owns us. He owns our bodies. We've gone through uh, a lot of weddings in our church. Can you imagine the bride or groom, doesn't matter which, which one you want to imagine, standing up in front of all the people there, minister there, and they're saying their valves. Not their valves, like the car valves, their vows, you know. And one of them turns to the other and says, Honey, I will love you with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my strength, but you can't have my body. Let me ask you, how would you feel if you were the groom or the bride and, and the other one turns to say their vows? How, what, would, what would be the first thing that rushed through your mind when they said their vows? Anybody? Would you be shocked? Would you be disappointed? Honey, I love you with all my heart and soul and strength, but I want to do with my body whatever I feel like doing. Would that make you feel like there's really, uh, we're going to hit a snag somewhere along our marriage because I don't have all of that person. I want you to turn to that other passage I asked you to look at, please. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I want you to hear what Paul says to the church and the believers at Rome and, or in Rome. He says, therefore, in verse 1, he says, therefore, I beseech you. That word beseech means, what, what does some other translation mean? What, what does a, I beseech you says... Pardon? Appeal? Okay. A beg? I like the word beg. A lot of men know what, what it means to beseech their wife because they had to beg for them to marry him. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. But I beg, I urge you, some translations have, I beseech you therefore, brethren, these are God's people, that you present your what? Your bodies. God is definitely interested in our bodies, and it's about time as individuals of, of, of belonging to the family of God, we start talking about how do we glorify God with our bodies, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present. I don't know if you've worked for a company for 25 or 30 years, and probably when you retire, they present you with a gift, usually something of value. Or if you want to change the accent, you can ta talk about present. You know, present is something we, of value. Usually we wrap up and give in honor of somebody. That we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Why is it important to be a living sacrifice? Because Dead sacrifices don't have any value, do they? A living sacrifice. And when it, what's the next two words? Holy, acceptable. We've been studying on Sunday mornings this word holy means sanctified, to set apart. God wants our bodies to be set apart from the rest of the world. And when it is set apart, it becomes acceptable. Who does it become acceptable to? God. Which is your reasonable service. The word reasonable means logical. 
Why is it then that we will gladly endorse, and correctly so, and gladly proclaim, and gladly embrace the fact that Jesus bodily gave his life for us? He died for us, but we cannot somehow be happy in living for him. Doesn't that just baffle you? Which is your reasonable service? God puts a great value on our bodies. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Let's stop right there. Do not be conformed. That word conform means squeezed. J.B. Phillips uh, paraphrases that. says, don't let the world squeeze you into its molds. You folks know what it is like to be squeezed with your body. You just try to put on that pair of blue jeans you had on last year, and you will squeeze, and you might even get some overflow problems. Let me give you an example of this idea of squeezing. Play-Doh. You ever have that Play-Doh stuff that, that uh, the kids always seem to eat? Play-Doh in of itself does nothing. But in order for it to have a figure, in, for, in order to be, take shape, it has to be squeezed. Pressure has to be applied so that it will conform to the figure that you have laid out for it. And do not be conformed to this world's, but be transformed. The world wants to squeeze us believers into its mold, to conform to this world's. We are squeezed all the time. Usually, the squeezing, the Pressure to conform comes from our peers. It comes from our co-workers. It comes from our family. They want us to conform to this world. They want us to adopt the thinking, the actions, the attitudes, the philosophy of this world. Let me give, give you an example, and you kind of fill in the blanks here. When you go to trial, anybody ever got, no, we won't talk about that. Uh, if you go to trial and, and you decide to have trial by jury, who do they select the jury from? Your peers. Why is that? Why don't they select a jury of the senior people in our community? Because in all honesty, most of our peers are idiots. Not all of them, most of our peers are just as lost and confused as anybody. But no, we select a group of your peers to judge you. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. You know what that word transform comes from the Greek word metamorphosis. All science majors or want to be science majors, give me an example of metamorphosis. Pardon? When the when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. And let me ask you this. When you know that metamorphosis has taken place, a caterpillar has changed into a butterfly, do you see any remnants of the caterpillar? You can't even figure out that that was a caterpillar. In other words, God wants us to be so transformed, you don't, we're unrecognizable to the rest of the world. Years ago, perhaps in the late 1980s and 1990s, and maybe even today, they, they used to have uh, toys called Transformers. And, uh, and you used to be able to, to pull out this part, and pull out that part, and, and, and swing things around, and it becomes something totally unrecognizable. From a monster to a car, who would have thunk? You see? But, but God wants us to be transformed. Something unrecognizable. It goes on and says this, and how do you become that? By the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable. There's that word acceptable. 
and perfect will of God. I'm convinced that God wants us to use our bodies to bring glory to him. And we need to change our thinking. We need to change our living because for a lot of times we don't do that. We're going to talk about some practical examples and practical ways that we do that. We often talk very generically. Oh, we need to live better. We need to do this better. We need to do that. And that, that's fine, but we're going to get specifics. So I've got three areas that I think God wants to change us. And if you know Christ as your Savior and you desire to be transformers, not conformers, transformers, you may want to ask yourself, as we go through these areas, at your stage of life, whatever that may be, does God need to work and change my way of thinking and change my actions? And these three things all start with the letter A. So if you're taking notes, this should not be a problem for you. And if I'm going too fast, let me so, uh, uh, tell me and I'll slow down. Number one, our actions. Our actions need to represent Jesus Christ. And more often than not, they don't. Let me give you an illustration. My daughter at one time used to work in a local restaurant in a small town. You know the only people that ever got kicked out of that restaurant? An unsaved man. The only people were church people church people, and it could care less what denominations they were from, church people, people who claims to love God, to want people to know God, were the only group ever kicked out of that restaurant because of their actions. How embarrassing. How disappointing. How much damage it did in that community to many make Christ. God wants our actions to be different. They have to be different. Because that's what, that's how we change a world by living a life that is different than everybody else. Let me give you another example. I used to, might find this hard to believe, I used to play on the church slow pitch league. And the key word there was slow. Uh, we, we would have a seventh inning stretch, but we would start it in the third inning because we, you know, by the time it got to the seventh inning, we were all played out. And you know what? There came a time where there was a confrontation between two teams Things were said. Things were done. Not too long after that, I quit. Because it wasn't worth it. Am I going to be happy when God, when I get to heaven and God puts his arm around me? Do you think God's going to say to me, well, Graham, you were, you were safe. The umpire blew the call, and you were right to stand up, and you were right to yell at him. Congratulations, because you were safe. Or do you think God's going to say, Graham, yeah, you might have been safe. He might have made the bad call. But thank you for displaying character of godliness in spite of that. See, our actions are things we need to change. What do you do when you go to a restaurant and somebody, the server brings you the wrong plates? The wrong food, your coffee is cold? Do you seek to embarrass them and humiliate them just to prove your points? Or are you gracious and compassionate? You see, look, you, you say, well, my food was cold. It's not the right... That may be true, but there are ways to conduct yourself in a godly manner, even in spite when you have to deal with a problem. And so often our testimony has been tarnished and ruined because our actions are more in conformity to this world than they are transformers. 
of Christ. The other area number two. Well, before we go to area number two, I want to just mention a couple of things. Not only do our actions to this outside world have to be transformation, have to lead to transformation, our actions in the church need to be so also. How we conduct ourselves in the church. You see, this, this isn't a, a really an action thing. It's a heart thing, isn't it? It's an attitude thing. It's just like when you talk about money and giving tithe, money and tithe are irrelevant to God because he really doesn't care. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill, and you know the price of beef is just enormous. All he has to do is, is sell some cattle. But you know what it is? It's a barometer of our hearts. So giving is not the thing that God's worried about. It's, it's our heart attitude. And when we come to church, when we become the focal points and we draw attention to ourselves, I think we have missed the mark of why we're here. Whether it's my action on the playing field or my action on the platform, when I draw attention to myself, then that means God doesn't get any of the glory. And we've missed the point of why we're here. Now, there are some churches that call certain activities part of their worship. There are some churches that a person can attend that there were, uh, there's uncontrollable laughter during the service. There are some churches that people dance in the aisles during the service. There are some churches where people are mo moaning or making animal noises all in the name of worship. And I think, I think God is embarrassed by that because Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says this, God is not the author of confusion. Let everything be done decently and in order. And I think in our churches, in our personal lives, we need to realize that God cares about how we conduct ourselves publicly and when we get together corporately for prayer. Number one is actions. Number two is attitudes. We were at a church once and I have to be completely honest with you. I've never had or been involved in a church that had so many stubborn women. That is true. And almost from the get-go there, there was one woman that you knew how her day was going by, how she looked. And if she didn't like you or anything that you did or think or thought or could, or she'd go like this. You see, what happens is actions and attitudes are very closely linked. It's often out of our attitudes that come our actions. But you know, I'll tell you this in all honesty, while she was a difficult woman, while she caused all sorts of problems in the course of our being there, God did a transformation in her heart. Oh, she still, she had a tough background. She had a lot of things in her life uh, stemming from her mother and her relationship with her mother and, and, and her sister and all sorts of things, baggage she carried with her until she decided to leave it all behind. And you could see over the course of years, her attitude changed and her attitude softened. What's your attitude in church? What's your attitude at home? Sometimes we're in church and, and our whole attitude in church is we've got to win at all cost. 
doesn't matter what the fight is, we will always have the last word. Let me ask you a question. Is it going to be worth it? Oh, you might win. But what is the carnage you leave behind for your family, for your church body? We have to be able to say, look, I have a preference, but I choose not to make a big deal out of it, and that's fine. I'm willing to be a transformer of God's grace by my attitudes towards things that I have. Pre we all have preferences, don't we? So they don't serve vanilla ice cream downstairs for the potluck and you have chocolate. So you can make a big deal about it or you can say, look, I'm going to give my chocolate to somebody else or I'm going to enjoy it and say thank you. Our attitudes are important. The last thing that we're going to talk about is perhaps... The difficult or the more challenging one because I never hear much said about this if God is owner of our bodies because he paid a price by the way what kind of death did God Jesus die a bodily death so if he's owner of our bodies and I belong to him and God wants me to transform my actions he wants to bring glory to himself through my attitudes. There's one other area that perhaps we overlook or maybe we don't even think about it because we have been so conditioned by this world, so conformed to this world, that is, it has escaped our thinking. And that's the third one, our appearance. Our appearance. Now let me think, let's think about this for a minute. I, would, I think you would agree that our society, and we're lumping everybody together, our society dresses for the attention of others. It amazes me how people can walk downtown in the clothes they dear do only to gain attention, only to gain the eyes of others. Whereas we, who belong to Jesus Christ, he owns our bodies, should be dressing and acting and thinking to honor him. Advertisers know this. Advertisers plans their, plan their, their advertising campaigns to promote the fact that we are not happy with how we look. We are not happy and we want to make you better. Okay, uh, here's where you participate. I want you to tell me advertisements on television that cause us to be dissatisfied with our bodies. Okay, go. Any, nobody? How about toothpaste commercials? If you use snow, not snow white, what's that? A light bright or whatever, you will have nice shiny teeth. People will love you. What other kind of commercials? Hair, oh, you had to bring that up. Yeah, hair commercials, yes. And they have the wind blowing in your hair and oh yeah, you've gotta have the, and the conditioner. What else? Tommy Hill figure. When you get to my age, it's Tommy No figure, okay? And, 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 and so you've got to dress. You've got to have these kind of clothes because why? They present a persona that without this, you are nothing. And that's how society looks at you. Something else. Pardon? Cars, yes, you've got to drive the right car. Something else. How about perfume and aftershave? Spray some Lysol on and everybody will come flocking to you. Maybe that's my problem. You know, we have all have, and they know this. They have created an idea of dissatisfaction. 
Now, some of you are sit, sitting there and, and maybe, maybe thinking, well, Graham, uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. I'm going to challenge that, and I'm saying sometimes you can. And if you don't believe me, maybe you and I can go together sometimes, and we can walk through the, the chapters store. And I can tell you by looking at some of the covers, I'm not reading that one. I'm not reading that one. I'm not re- that one I'm not so sure of. I can take you down to Cole's bookstore and we can go along and I can say, no, I'm not reading that one because what, whatever the cover portrays or, or portrays, something like that is going to be inside. I can take you to the local variety store and we can look at all the magazines down there. We can stand in the checkout at Sobeys and I can say, this is the stuff I don't want to read. We represent God in how we look. No, I'm not advocating that we have people stand at the door and and measure the, the length of your skirt or whatever. I am suggesting that because we are examples and transformers to the world, we need to act and look and think differently than the rest of the world. Now, you might not be happy, and that's okay. But you see, when... We look at ourselves as instruments to gain the attention and the affection of others, and we have bypassed what God thinks of us. We have created in our society an obsession with our bodies. In other words, our bodies become our gods. Now, please don't misunderstand we, God, because the Bible says God lives in us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, he lives in us. In fact, it uses the word temple. We are his temple. T- talk to me about the temple. What, what do you think of when you think of the temple? Not only was it the place that God dwelt, what other things? Absolutely. It had to be clean. You couldn't just let anybody go into the temple. The priests were responsible for making it a holy place, a sanctified place, something else. So if God lives in me, he owns me, and I am his temple, I need to keep myself clean and pure in my actions, in my attitudes, in my appearance, because this is what glorifies him. This is what brings honor and glory to him. And that's my whole purpose in life. Not to attract the attention of other people. We have created in our generation, and unfortunately, it has permeated our Christian lives. We have created a generation that has bought into this disillusionment. Because now what we find ourselves always measured in how we look. If people find us attractive, if people like us, young men, here's my little gem of the day. Marrying a girl for her looks is like buying a house for its paint. Now, we know some houses need more paint than others. But the thing is, if that is all, if that becomes our priority, if that becomes our goal, the attractiveness of one person above another, we will become very disillusioned, very disappointed, and probably divorced. You know why? Because it doesn't matter if, the, if that's your only goal, There will always come along someone who is younger and prettier than the one you've chosen. There is always going to be someone that comes along, ladies, who has more muscles and a bigger car and a bigger bank account. And pretty soon, if that's your only basis for for desiring, for getting married, you are going to, you live a very shallow life. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says in 
Proverbs chapter 31. It says this. The King James Version says this. Proverbs 31 verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but the woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. I used to be a lot better looking than I am now. My wife won't even say amen to that. God says, favor is deceitful. Don't be deceived. Beauty is vain. Beauty is empty. But the woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Here is the New King James version of that. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And we have to teach our young people that God wants us to be transformers, not conformers. And this world has done its job, and it has done a good job of squeezing us into its mold. This world has pretty well defined us and defined, it our, uh, defined our generation and has come up with this conclusion. You are only worthy if, and acceptable and lovely if you meet this criteria. God says, I have created you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we need to teach our young people that. Here, I wrote one for the guys, just in case you, or the girls, just in case they felt left out. Now, this is the Graham Clark version. If I were to write Proverbs 31, verse 30, it would go like this. Forget the car, forget the bod, look for a man who desires God. <laughs> See, we need to teach our young people. That because God owns us, we do not have the rights. We do not have the opportunity to make our own decisions concerning our bodies. And we need to be diligent in presenting them as holy, acceptable, perfect in God's sight. And we need to create a generation of people that will start to think in terms like that and not buy into the program that what, hap what, what we are is just a body of skin and bones. And as that skin and bones starts to decay and get older, then we will move on to somebody else. Now, here's the challenge. I said a few moments ago that it's a spiritual issue. But if all you have to offer someone is a body, and maybe even a beautiful body, you're going to be so disillusioned. Why am I telling you this? Because if you continue to have these, this philosophy in your life, you are going to face all sorts of heartache and pain and scars. You're going to make decisions you wish you would have never made. You were going to have regrets that you, you would say, if I looked back, I could do it all over again. I would do things differently. Because that's all this world offers us is a body. It doesn't offer us any more. God says, I have created you and you are, a, in my image, you are precious. I love you very much. I want the best for you. Most of this world offers is not the best for you. But we get so insecure and nobody will like me. What happens if all my classmates are getting married before me? I have to have a girlfriend. I have to have a boyfriend. And it's when we get desperate, we often make decisions that lead us down the wrong path. It's interesting. We live in a world that is self-absorbed. But a woman who fears the Lord, you know what she looks at? She doesn't look at a body. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with, with a, a person having a, a well-kept body. Because it does say this. 
It does say a person is disciplined. It does say a person uh, takes care of themselves. But if that's all they look at, a, a, a woman and a man need to be looking at quality, character qualities, integrity, hard work, compassion, godliness. Those are qualities you can't change. Those are qualities that won't change. And perhaps if we as parents, and I'm not blaming the church, because you see, our our job as parents is to teach our children. Not the church's job, it's our job as parents. And if we had done a better job teaching our children that God loves them for who they are, then maybe we wouldn't be having problems with dealing with gender issues. Maybe we wouldn't have young men and young women feeling insecure about who they are if we would have done a better job saying that God loves you and I love you and he's got great things for you and he wants to use you to reach other people so that you can bring glory to him. I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, this thing gets out of control so easily, doesn't it? If we would have done a, a better job as parents, if we as fathers would have taken more time to teach our young men to act like men, to look like men, to talk like men, we wouldn't be dealing with a lot of issues that we're dealing with now. We wouldn't have young men who are acting like women, talking like women, conducting themselves like women. And if our moms would have done that to their girls, taught their girls how to act like women, talk like women, and and dress like women, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems we're having with issues now concerning our girls. And we wouldn't have our girls desiring and acting and appearing like men, would we? Oh, how we've strayed. Now, thing is, those kind of behaviors and those kind of actions and those kind of attitudes and those kind of appearances unfortunately happen in our church midst. And we as people of God have to take the initiative to deal with these issues. To teach. That's why Timothy told, uh, Paul told Timothy in in, uh, 1 Timothy, let the old women teach the young women how to be, how to love their husbands. Number one, how to love their husbands, not somebody else's husband, how to love their husbands, be keeper at home, be chaste, lest Satan gets in there and causes all sorts of confusion. And he's done that, hasn't he? When our country was established in 1867, we generally took on the, the, the Christian idea of setting aside one day a week for worship. And uh, that one day a week was established as Sunday. But you know, these kind of attitudes slip into our church, and if we're not careful, it'll become, we'll become overwhelmed. Let me give you an example. I believe that the day we set aside as Sunday is a special day. I've, we have tried in, my, uh, in our family to teach our children that it is a special day. It is God's day. We go to God's house to meet with God so that when we go, we want to dress. We want to dress in a way that would bring honor and glory to God, not honor and glory to ourselves. 
We want to conduct ourselves in a way that would be pleasing to God, not draw attention to ourselves. Our attitudes are ones that have to be right. And I'm afraid that we, we've let those kind of things slip. You see, now, because so much of society doesn't view God's day as any different than the rest of the week. And I don't believe, and you may disagree, that, that's fine. When you get a chance to preach, you can do so. But I think we need to look at God's day as different. We need to dress differently. This is God's day. When, when the children of Israel went to the temple, they didn't wear their ordinary stuff. They made it a special day. They made it significant. And I'm afraid that a lot of our society and even a lot who claim to know Christ have seemed to minimize the importance of God's day. Oh, folks, we need to be diligent. We need to be people who are transformers. So where does this all leave us? How do we... Apply this. Well, we've talked about some very sensitive, I suspect, and very direct things. But first of all, we need young people, single young people, unmarried young people, to make a commitment. If they are a child of God, God owns me. I will keep my body pure. I will set it apart for his purposes. And when the right person comes along and is willing to commit their whole person to me, body, soul, and spirit, then maybe I will commit my whole person to them. And I will not fall into the trap of giving my life and giving my body to anybody who comes along and says, Boy, you're cute. Or bats their eyelashes at me and say, hi, honey, but I will keep myself pure. We need young people who will do that because our churches and our world desperately lead people who will make that commitment. We need moms and dads to teach their kids. And you know the way, when to teach them is when they're small. When they're newborn, you say, well, my kid is only, or my child is only one year, two years, three years. Well, you teach, first of all, you teach them by example. They will pick up on example. It's amazing. We have several grandchildren, but we, we have a grandson, and it is amazing. He's just turned one, and it's amazing how his thinking process already starts to develop. He can't walk, he can't talk, but he can think, he can analyze, he can make decisions. They might be small decisions, they might not be major. You start when they're young. You start bringing them out to church when they're young. If you want them to get a passion for God, you be here when they're young. Because sooner or later, they will determine what is important to you and they will figure out, and if it's important to you, it will probably be important to them. Let me give you an example. If school is important to you, your children will, at an early age, know that, and it'll become important to them. If sports is important to you, and you have no problem skipping this Sunday and that Sunday for, for a tournament. And, and, and you're gone all nights of the week. And you spend so many thousands of dollars on, on your particular sport. They will know that too. If entertainment is important to you. All sorts of things. Your kids will determine that before you know it. But if God's important to you, they will pick that up too. You see... Us as parents have the greatest impact or should have the greatest impact on our children. But what happens is as, as parents, we kind of let that go. 
will say, oh, we'll talk about it when they're 12, 13, or 14. Let me tell you something, parents. You better talk and start to prepare them now, even when they're 2 or 3 or 4, because before you know it, they're going to be 12 and 13 and 14. And if you don't deal with it now, they'll learn it from somewhere else. And if, it, and if, you, don't lo- if you don't deal with it now, you might not like where they learn it from. You teach it. God has blessed us, and I, I say that in all sincerity, with 11 children. We have never, never had a fight about coming to church. Why? It was never a discussion. It was never up for option. We, we never discussed it. You want to go to church today, or you want to stay home? They just, even now, Sunday comes, unless we're, we're sick or something like that, we're here in church. We never gave them an option. It was you do it and... You do it. That's the two options they had. And we as parents need to create in our children at an early age. Remember that passage that pastor was referring to, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15? That from a child, Paul writes to Timothy, Thou hast known the holy scriptures which were able to make thee what? Wise unto salvation. We teach them. It's possible that you're here and you're a single parent. You say, I find that tough, being a single parent, raising two or three children, and I've got this job, and I I can imagine, and I'm sorry. God never said it was going to be easy. God never said you wouldn't have to do it alone. But still your responsibility as a parent to do that. We need grandparents. I know in our society, the role of the grandparent is greatly changed because we need grandparents to use what influence they have. We need young men to fulfill their responsibilities as fathers. We need more men with character and less men who are characters. How do we, why do we do that? Because God owns us. We are not at liberty to do as we please. Why does God own us? Because he paid for us. I beseech you, therefore, I beg of you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It has nothing to do with your tattoos or your piercings. Although both sound like awful, painful things, and I try to avoid, but it, it ha, it's a spiritual issue. If we present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and don't be squeezed into the mold, because when we go home and turn on the television today, we will be created with this pressure to conform to the world and how it thinks and how it behaves and how it acts and how it dresses. Don't do that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good. And when God sees us take our bodies and bring glory to him in our actions and our attitudes and even how we, we, we dress, he'll see that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, I would assume or presume that there are some who struggle with things that we talked about today. And I understand that. They are things that perhaps hit some nerves. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we have so slowly shifted our thoughts from being transformed, and and before we know it, we become so influenced by our peers and by our neighbors and by our coworkers that we have gradually conformed to this world. I would ask that in our lives, you would help us in our attitudes, in our action, even in our appearance, that we would honor and glorify God. The things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we wear would honor and glorify him. 
And when he looked at us and he would look at us, he says, yes, I find that acceptable. I find that good. May our thoughts and our desires be to transform society around us that we may ultimately share the glorious transforming grace of our Savior. In Jesus' name.